Scientists have picked up where occult practitioners have left off and sought to solve mysteries that the magicians had long tried to understand. March 17, 1863. John Pelham leads his company into the Battle of Kelly's Ford on a field in Virginia. Pelham was famed for his courage but this was to be his final battle. More than a century later in Chicago, Illinois, Margaret Barrett feels a searing pain in her head. Could this nurse from the Midwest and a Civil War major have some connection? Margaret believes she was the major in a past life. When people have an experience of a past life, the truth is unshakable. It's a self-evident truth and anybody could doubt the existence of that past life. But the people who have had the experience, you're not gonna shake the truth from them. They know. Most believe otherwise, but men like Isaac Newton, Galileo, Carl Jung, are responsible for creating some of science's biggest breakthroughs that were once considered mystical. Now, how do you know some of the things we now regard as supernatural and inconceivable may turn out to be perfectly valid, legitimate science 50 years from now. Ever since the Renaissance, scientists have pushed far beyond accepted boundaries. Before the age of technology, scientists relied on belief and intuition. The original occultists believed the universe was a field of consciousness that they could access to decipher the work of the gods. When we think we are separate from each other. We're actually just part of one great universe. And that was the kind of core idea that the occult the magicians had, they expressed it beautifully at one point by saying, as above, so below. It really means that wherever you look, the patterns will be the same at the microscopic level, at our level, and at the cosmic level. These magicians believed that the universe and the mind were linked, a connection that quantum physicists are still trying to prove. And people find this very exciting the, the, com the uh, overlay between the way the brain works and the way the universe works. But other New Age practices like channeling and exploring past lives are not accepted. All these experiences that are claimed to be occult sometimes originate in the brain from brain pathology. And this makes you wonder about all of these phenomena, you know, what's causing them. Just because you find that people with temporal seizures experience God doesn't negate the idea of God, but it does make you wonder you know, what religious experience is all about, because there are neural structures in the brain that predispose you to religious belief and mysticism. The link between magic and science has always been strong. And once the mystical is proven, it can become scientific fact. It's a pursuit that has shaped the world and man's understanding of it from the time of Newton. Isaac Newton was born in the 17th century, when man still believed the cosmos revolved around the Earth. He is known both as the father of modern science and the last of the great magicians. Newton was an extraordinary intellect. He was able to concentrate for endless hours and sometimes it seemed days on an issue. He could keep in mind all of the parts. Newton vividly imagined his theories and only later backed them up with experiments a practice now known as an altered state of consciousness. People can do this by running or exercising. People can do it by fasting. People can do it by uh, drinking or drugging. People can do it by prayer or meditation. There, there are many uh, hypnotism. There are many venerable practices over thousands of years where people have altered their state of consciousness. Well, I think creativity really um, requires something like the acceptance of intuition, acceptance of inspiration as the starting point for ideas that turn out to be profound, important, and even scientific ideas. If you open yourself to the cosmos, you will be filled with new knowledge. Newton was trying to build on the theories of a man who died in 1642. 
the same year he was born, Galileo. Galileo was mapping the stars and the planets. By then, astrology was a centuries-old science. In the ancient mystery schools, um, and uh, let's say Egyptians as well as Pythagoreans, um, their aim would have been to connect to the gods and implore them to do something, and then the gods, being powerful, would do the thing. Galileo was not trying to contact the gods. He was trying to explain their work. During the Renaissance, scientists followed the teachings of Aristotle. The work of this third century BC Greek were the theories accepted by the Catholic Church. The uh, idea of motion was extremely different from what we presently understand. The notion was that every kind of object or substance had its natural place with uh, earth at the bottom and then water, air, and fire and the quintessence that the heavens were made of above that, and that objects tended to remain in their natural places, and that to move them you needed to push on them continuously. He also taught that the Earth was the center of the solar system, and that a heavy object would fall faster than a lighter one. These were accepted truths until Galileo. Galileo confirmed that the Earth revolved around the sun. Aristotle believed that matter falls because it knows its place in the cosmos. The hand of its creator guides it to return to its place of origin. Galileo's understanding of gravity was much more advanced, and he used scientific method to prove his theories. Aristotle, who was a great thinker, believed that heavy objects fall much faster than light objects, and he needed five minutes to test this. All he needed was five minutes to go up in a building, take a rock, take a pea, and drop them at the same time. He never did. And the reason is the concept of an experiment is alien to the human mind. But not to Galileo. He did the experiment and found that they fell at the same rate. So this is why we think Galileo was a great genius, because he said, we can ask questions about nature, not have preconceived notions. We can start with an open mind and say, what happens? when you drop a big stone on a, on a tiny pea. And lo and behold, he found something counterintuitive, which anybody can test and verify. Galileo thoroughly discredited the sacred Aristotelian worldview of the church and paid dearly for it. The cardinals of the Inquisition rejected his theories. He kept publishing, and for his efforts, he was found guilty of heresy. Galileo was placed under house arrest in 1633 and spent the rest of his life under the Inquisition's watchful eye. It took 350 years for the church to admit that they were wrong. By then, Newton had confirmed Galileo's conclusions. Isaac Newton was fascinating. Uh, he, was, he was born on Christmas Day. He was a widow's son. Um, he was raised in a kind of austere uh, surroundings and uh, went off to college and kind of never stopped being at college and uh, studied the rest of his life. Uh, from a young man, he studied everything there was in the universe to study. The Renaissance had been fueled by the rediscovery of long-lost early Greek and occult texts. Scholars like Newton were thrilled to discover new ideas in science, religion, and magic. Newton was not only a scientist, he was an avowed alchemist. Most of the brilliant people in history, and Isaac Newton was one of them, went into alchemy, went into various occult pursuits because they wanted to find out how things work and they were willing to go uh, as far as they needed to to satisfy their, their inquisitive minds. In Newton's time, there was no hard distinction between magic, spirituality, and science. Scientists used any method to expand their knowledge. He spent years searching for the crown jewel of alchemy, the Philosopher's Stone. The stone was not an actual gem, but a higher level of consciousness that would enable scientific and spiritual breakthroughs. Alone in his room with his alchemical experiments, Newton would go for days without food or sleep. People who study creativity say there are several stages. First, you have to learn a great deal, and then you have to um, let that incubate and kind of bubble inside you. And then it will turn into something like an inspiration. That's what the alchemists were trying to do as well and what Newton did so successfully. Newton took on Galileo's challenge of refuting Aristotle. 
When he applied his mind to Aristotle's theory of falling objects and the orbit of the planets, he made the most important discovery of physics, gravity. It was groundbreaking. When Newton thought about gravity, he had to conceive of the idea that two bodies can attract each other at a distance. And even today, we have trouble figuring out how that happens. I mean, how, how is it that the sun knows that Jupiter is there? <laughs> Who knows? The emerging breed of empirical scientists were very uncomfortable with the whole idea that something could affect another object without touching it, without being connected to it in some way. Then we have Newton coming in with this mathematical theory that accounts perfectly for astronomical observations, but it requires there to be a force between these two different objects, and there's nothing in between. So he was basically stuck with action at a distance, no matter how uncomfortable it made him or anybody else. Newton was also the first to discover the properties of light and believed that light was composed of particles. Aristotle's worldview uh, didn't accept the idea of, of atoms, of indivisible components of objects. Um, but it's clear from, for instance, Newton's writings on light that he had some definite ideas along those lines, that he thought of light as being a stream of tiny, rapidly moving particles of some sort, corpuscles, as he wrote. In 1687, Newton published his masterwork, Principia, and he became an international sensation. In it, he set down his three laws of motion, the law of inertia, the relationship between force and motion, and his final rule, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Even though Newton had explained the universe, emotional difficulties would affect his work. The end of the 17th century brought important scientific advancement. Sir Isaac Newton had made an epic contribution to this revolution. But in 1675, he had a nervous breakdown. He had a number of things that happened to him all at once. He, he became depressed um, and holed up in his apartment and couldn't be brought out. He had to be dragged out of there by his friends. The legend goes that he had been practicing actual alchemy with chemistry and that the, the fumes may have made him somewhat crazy or psychotic. There's all kinds of ways to read that, and he might have had like a, simply a, a nervous breakdown. Newton never made another scientific breakthrough, but his work would endure. In the 1660s, a specter from the past haunted London, the Black Plague. 70,000 people died, then the Great Fire, but in the midst of this turmoil, a scientific first. In 1660, an elite group of British scientists formed the Royal Society, history's first organization devoted to the pursuit of science. The Royal Society started out sort of as a smart guys club, um, where they got together and discussed every conceivable topic that was, you know, probably a little risque, of course, because, um, you know, at, at various times, England was in the throes of religious uh, clampdowns. The threat of the church did not stop them. Newton himself would lead the Royal Society for 24 years. He is said to have uttered just one sentence during all those meetings. He asked for the window to be opened. But his near mystical focus would inspire another generation to look for the universe within the human brain. On its surface, a well-tuned machine of neurons and nerves perfectly synchronized for movement, learning, even defense. But there is more to the brain than just electric impulses. This remarkable organ contains people's thoughts, their past. Some would say it holds the soul. Newton's discovery of gravity transformed the way science understood the universe. But another member of the Royal Society, Thomas Willis, was about to overturn Aristotle in a different field, medicine. Willis began the first scientific exploration of the brain and its elusive software, the mind. Thomas Willis was an English physician, and he figured out how to study the brain, uh, which was a tough thing to do because the brain would dissolve in mere hours after death. Progress in medicine had been hampered by a long-standing taboo against dissection of the human body. It took a certain 
um, relaxation of the rules to ever get dissection to happen. A lot of times the practitioners were in fact criminals. They were, you know, they were declared to be criminals even though they were scientists. Um, it was uh, against the law and every other thing to uh, dissect a human body. Until the Renaissance, doctors believed Aristotle's view that the heart was the home of the mind. Few in medicine were able to conceive that the shapeless white mass inside the skull could possibly be the seat of reason and artistic expression. Willis suspected that the brain held more than his colleagues assumed. So he figured out a way to preserve it and then was able to distinguish all of the parts of the brain which nobody had really come to grips with before. Like Newton, Willis was an alchemist willing to experiment to get to the truth. Willis was the first to dissect the nerves leading to the brain. He explained how they functioned together. His lectures held his audiences spellbound. In 1664, he published Cerebre Anatomy, at the time, the most comprehensive study of the brain. A young student named John Locke built on his work and investigated the nature of thinking itself. Locke was primarily a philosopher. In 1660, he published his essay concerning human understanding, distancing himself from Aristotle. Locke really challenged the Aristotelian notion that ideas were innate in the human mind and instead focused on the development of ideas and the developmental process and the ways the brain apprehended the universe was really one of the first efforts to describe a neuroscience and what the brain actually does. Neuroscience became a new discipline that is still full of mystery. I think it's true that there's the brain, there are neurons firing, and there's the mind, okay? But regarding the mind itself, we have barely scratched the surface of how it works. What do you mean by creativity? What do you mean by consciousness? What do you mean by self-awareness? Scientists now understand how much of the brain works inside the skull, but are still trying to discover how the mind can affect the world outside of its casing. In Paris, medical astrologer Franz Anton Mesmer stumbled almost by accident upon hypnosis. At the time, Mesmer was experimenting with magnets as a means of curing illness. Well, Franz Mesmer uh, would have people sit in a tub and he used magnets with these tubs and it was often referred to as anal magnetism which is interesting because magnets have recycled again today and medical doctors are using electromagnetism as a way of healing. Mesmer first believed that the magnets exerted the invisible force of animal magnetism. Later, he thought that the force emanated from within him and he abandoned the magnets. In actuality, Mesmer had only rediscovered another lost occult art. The first induced hypnotic performance, recorded on papyrus in a British museum, was given at the court of Khufu in Egypt over 5,000 years ago. Later, seers at the Greek oracle of Delphi used self-hypnosis to foresee the future. Modern hypnosis, as practiced in the United States, uh, begins with Franz Mesmer. But if you go back even further, Every culture has a way of going into a trance. It could be using music, it could be using dance, uh, it could be sitting in meditation. His treatment became popular in the 1770s, and Mesmer's fame quickly spread as scores of patients claimed themselves cured through mesmerism. He was able to put people under in, in a trance and um, suggest to them things that were good, like getting better, like healing. Uh, he became famous for that, and they actually had to have a committee of scientists, and that was actually uh, Ben Franklin was one of the committee who tried to decide whether anything about this was real or not. They said, well, it, mesmerism works, uh, but we think it works because of the imagination. Uh, not some other operative principle. Mesmer was dismissed by many as a quack, but in 1843, London surgeon John Elliotson began using what he called the mesmerizing coma to perform major surgery without pain. Anesthesia had yet to be invented, and Elliotson's technique resulted in more than 300 successful operations. Mesmer's influence was short-lived, with the discovery of ether, hypnosis was once again dismissed by traditional medicine. So rather than pick up on the idea that our beliefs 
can help us heal and help us recover, they just it discounted the work of Mesmer. But he had laid the foundation for modern hypnosis, a practice that is now accepted as a form of treatment by the medical establishment. Hypnosis relies on suggestibility, imagination. Our bodies can't distinguish between a real and imagined experience. For example, there was a recent study done with anger and heart disease. How researchers got people angry is they had them imagine situations that made them angry. And so just as they imagined themselves angry, their body responded as if they were actually had reason, cause to be angry, and there was a change that they were able to identify. But the real beauty of this experiment was the power of the imagination. Our imaginations can make us angry or our imaginations can make us happy and peaceful. Whether we're angry or whether we're happy is our choice. An entire field of alternative medicine has developed that utilizes imagining techniques to promote healing. There are over 22 studies done on visualization and cancer healing. 18 of those studies conclusively shows visualization helps fight cancer. It's no surprise. Obviously, the brain regulates our bodily functions. So if you could influence the brain, either through meditation, through developing certain frequencies of brain waves, uh, through introducing images and ideas, of course you're going to be able to have a, an effect on the materiality of disease uh, or, or, and the efficacy of medicine. Scientists have thoroughly studied the phenomenon, but remain unsure why and how it works. There are two criteria when you encounter a new phenomenon. One is, does it fit the big picture of what we know in science or about the mind, right? Two is, is it repeatable? Hypnosis is rejected for the first reason, which is not a good reason to reject something. Namely, how does it fit into what we understand about the brain and mind? What is this hypnosis business? How can you enter somebody else's mind and make him wiggle his hand or do silly things? It doesn't make any sense. Reject it. But the second criterion, repeatability, it's very repeatable. You can do it on hundreds of people. And that's been staring at us for over 100 years. We know it's a perfectly valid, legitimate phenomenon. We just don't have an explanation for it. Before Mesmer, doctors had struggled for centuries to understand the problems they saw in their patients that could not be explained with existing medical science. Conditions like insanity and hysteria were treated using a vast array of misguided cures, from leeches to exorcisms. Things like, um what we now call schizophrenia or depression, uh, those kinds of things were, looked like some kind of infection of, um, by demons. No one ever thought the brain could be their source. Locke's essay on human understanding gave rise to a new science, psychology. In 1885, a 29-year-old Viennese doctor named Sigmund Freud was struggling to cure the hysteria he encountered in many of his female patients. Freud had begun his medical career researching the nervous system, but nothing in accepted science could help his patients. In 1885, humanity was on the move. Carl Benz has created the first gasoline-powered vehicle. But Dr. Sigmund Freud was running into a brick wall, trying to help solve the emotional problems of his patients. Then he tried hypnosis. He put his patients under and found that they remembered past traumas. Physicists had recently developed a new understanding about energy, that it could not be destroyed, only transformed. Freud was inspired by their work. He was brilliant, he was opinionated, and he was uh, a pretty good learner. So he was looking around and he saw the systemized knowledge that was coming into force in what was called natural science, eventually became physics. He just lifted those metaphors out, put them into the psyche. Freud discovered the unconscious. Freud saw the human personality as a psychic energy system. Energy that was not expressed consciously was diverted into the patient's unconscious, where it created neurosis. Freud identified repressed sexual energy as the root cause of all mental illness. And his ideas are still very much in force. We still think about our um, deepest motivations being hidden and supplanted by replacement motives and so forth. That's, that's a Freudian extrapolation of the physics model into a psychic domain. 
Freud invented psychoanalysis as a method for releasing the sexual traumas buried in the unconscious. This was the new frontier of the study of consciousness. And though much of Freud's work would eventually fall out of favor, his work provided the foundation for modern psychology. The conservative Freud would never have identified himself as an occultist, but one of his followers would prove to be both a pioneer in the field and an occult practitioner. He wanted to know everything about everything. He read everything. He traveled to Africa. He, he traveled to India. He traveled to America. He, uh, he was somebody who had a voracious appetite for experience and for trying to understand the psyche in all times and places and all, all uh, locations on the globe. Carl Jung was born 10 years before Freud invented psychoanalysis. The son of a minister, Jung conducted experiments in spiritualism. He became a psychologist to explore the dimensions of the mind, but never lost his lifelong fascination with the occult. His hero, Freud, became both a mentor and his nemesis. He didn't meet Freud until 1907. And when they met, they spoke for 13 hours straight. And uh, one of the things that came up was the occult. Jung had been a defender of Freud's sexual theory of hysteria before they met. He'd been a public defender of that. But he didn't believe the sexual theory explained everything. And when he sat with Freud during this 13-hour thing, Freud got a very, very serious expression on his face and looked at Jung and said, you must make, you must promise me one thing, dear son. You must, you must promise never to abandon the sexual theory and make of it a dogma and unshakable uh, bulwark against the black tide of mud. And then he hesitated and said, of occultism. Jung refused to believe that sexual repression explained everything. And he was not about to give up the occult. But Freud made certain that Jung paid a price. Jung was, at the time of his break with Freud, he was president of the International Psychoanalytical Association. And Freud uh, did not want to leave Jung in charge of the whole shop. And so behind the scenes, in what you might call an occult practice, he formed a little committee, and he gave each one of them a little signet ring, and he swore them all to secrecy, and they began to plot uh, in a kind of conspiratorial way about how to get rid of Carl Jung. After the break with Freud, Jung spiraled into a six-year depression. He retreated to his country house in Bollingen. Like Newton so many centuries before, he went in search of his own philosopher's stone. Jung constructed a tower at Bollingen, and uh, it was, um, he built it in some sense by his own hand, and he carved various kinds of stones out there with, with mystical figures on them. And he cooked on a primitive little stove with wood there. He chopped wood outside. He went down to the lake. He slept on a cot. It was a kind of retreat where he could go and introvert and, and have his own psychological experiences. He struggled with his own depression and emerged with a new kind of psychology, one that was steeped in mystic thought. He used tarot cards, he used astrology, but more importantly, whether it be tarot cards or astrology, Carl Jung believed in the intuition. Carl Jung once said, the therapist's job is to get his or her patient in touch with the intuition, and when the therapist has done that, the job is basically done. During his retreat, Jung concluded that astrology, alchemy, mythology, and the I Ching were ways the first magicians understood the human consciousness. His biggest breakthrough, he saw the psyche as an energy field far bigger than a single personality. He called this the collective unconscious. The collective unconscious includes all the things that are not personal to us, that transcend that. They're the transpersonal or impersonal contents of the unconscious that, that Jung called archetypes. They're the typically human components that don't have anything to do with us necessarily just personally. They're not about our personal experiences. It's not about our mother or our father. It's about the very idea of mother and father. Both Jung and Freud practiced the altered state of consciousness used by magicians to gain their deepest insights. For Freud, this was a method of free association. And for Jung, this is a method of active imagination, where you de deliberately induce a fantasy and you talk to uh, aspects of yourself that are personified in, in image form. This would be like in the occult or in mediumship or in seances, 
thinking that you're talking to the dead when you're actually talking to yourself or your many inner selves. While Freud had isolated the personality into a bundle of neuroses driven purely by sexual repression, Jung had brought the individual to higher ground, a place within a broader humanity that had meaning and continuity. We have both a personal unconscious and a collective unconscious. So the personal unconscious uh, is more aligned with our soul, and then our collective unconscious is the wisdom, the archetypes, the myths, the universalities that anybody can tap into. So we all have our own personal path that we're on, and we all have a collective path. Jung's ideas have inspired many New Age practices. Channeling might possibly come from something like Jung's uh, collective unconscious. Um, probably most people who are channelers would say it comes from a higher level of wisdom. And maybe it's the same thing. It, it certainly is a related kind of concept to the collective unconscious. But the typical presentation is as if there's some being, a departed soul, or maybe a group of them who now exist in some other dimension would have chosen to help us out by channeling some of their wisdom through a, one of your friends or neighbors. In Jung's work, dreams could yield valuable insights. Some psychologists have taken this one step further into a technique called lucid dreaming. Lucid dreams are a special category where not only are you dreaming, but you know you're dreaming, and you actually may even be able to directly influence the direction of the dream. But Jung's influence did not stop with psychology. His work inspired a physicist who would try to forge a connection between the occult and science. For centuries, the study of the universe and the mind were separate disciplines. In 1905, the 30-year-old Jung met a young German man working as a clerk in a Swiss patent office, Albert Einstein. In some ways, Einstein was a mystic at heart. As a child, he had observed the movements of a compass needle and vowed that he would one day learn the mind of God. Like Newton, he would enter an altered state of consciousness which he called mind exercises and intuitively arrive at his discoveries. Only later, Einstein would back them up with formulas and proofs. That year, Einstein published five papers of new physics in the journal Annalen der Physik, theories that rewrote the rules of the universe. In it, he posed his theory of relativity, which held that time and space are relative, changing concepts, not absolutes. Newton developed these wonderful things, the laws of motion and gravity and so on, which appeared to be just like clockwork. And it made everybody pretty happy, even though it was revolutionary at its time, because they discovered that the world, that the universe was a big giant clock and it all worked in an orderly way. Um, Einstein came along and said, well, yeah, that could be true, but also it's relative. <laughs> and it turned it all upside down again. In Einstein's autobiographical notes, he would ask Newton for forgiveness for revolutionizing the science of physics. Einstein had finally solved a contradiction Newton had observed an age ago in the behavior of light that it acted like a wave, but sometimes like a particle. And in the process, he finally proved Newton's intuition about the existence of atoms. The photoelectric effect, as it's called. Um, if you shine a bright light onto a piece of metal, it'll knock electrons loose. And the wave theory was simply not accounting for the details of how that happened. Then came Einstein in 1905, and was able to account for the photoelectric effect perfectly by saying that when light interacts with the metal, it comes in discrete bundles of energy that depend only on the frequency of the light and not its intensity. So it's still a wave. I mean, frequency is fundamentally a wave concept, but it's acting like a particle. Years later, Jung reported that Einstein's genius had influenced his entire body of intellectual work and Einstein's photoelectric theory laid the foundation for the later contradictions of the subatomic world, quantum physics. Consciousness appeared to affect the universe. Einstein had a very strong, basically philosophical conviction that a theory of physics should be complete, 
that if you know everything there is to know about a system, you can predict everything that it will do thenceforward. In quantum physics, there is no absolute. Everything changes according to observation. Einstein famously said that God does not play dice with the universe, and he repeated this often enough that one of, one of his colleagues, the attribution varies, told him, would you stop telling God what to do? Einstein rejected quantum physics, but quantum physics could not be ignored, and the concepts of the occult would help some understand this uncharted territory. To the new breed of quantum physicists, the mind itself played an integral role. How matter behaved depended completely on the observer. The idea that uh, physics, or that the physical reality is somehow a construct of the mind or is dependent on it, is certainly one of the ways that you can interpret quantum mechanics. And this is one of the reasons there's so much uh, argument generated, because some people really like that idea and some people really hate it. Quantum physicists call this the observer problem. If only conscious beings can be observers, then we're intimately hooked in to the very existence of reality. Without us, there would just be this expanding superposition of possibilities with nothing definite ever actually happening. Fifteen years after Einstein published his groundbreaking papers, Wolfgang Pauli, barely out of his teens, wrote a brilliant exposition of Einstein's relativity theory. The two pioneers of quantum mechanics, Max Born and Niels Bohr, encouraged Pauli to join their field. These mind-numbing problems became Wolfgang Pauli's obsession. Though a difficult and troubled man, Pauli was a master of intention. Other scientists called it the Pauli effect. His colleagues in, in the experimental laboratories in physics said, please, please stay away, because sure as he would arrive in the laboratory, all the experiments would stop working. They even claimed uh, that if Pauli went by the town in a train, that the experiments would stop working. He, like many of the others uh, we think of as great scientists, was a um, consummate intender. He could intend um, what was about to happen, and it would happen in a certain sense. He was one of the most creative uh, figures in quantum mechanics because of that. Pauli, like Newton, fell deep into this work, and eventually he had a mental collapse. In 1948, he went to the newly created C.G. Jung Institute to seek help from the now famous psychologist. As he walked into the room, the Pauli effect occurred. A vase suddenly fell to the floor. Both men would later say that when the vase shattered, they recognized their destiny. Together, they would try to comprehend the universe using both physics and psychology. Pauli became one of the great uh, contributors to the development of quantum physics, partly because of the intuitions that were fed, at least in part, by that kind of collaboration with a great intuitive thinker in a completely different domain, Carl Jung. And similarly, Jung understood much more and was able to express more usefully the kinds of things that he knew because of Pauli's contributions. The incident itself led them to develop the concept of synchronicity, where two supposedly random events collide to create meaning. Synchronicity, as Jung defines it, is uh, a correspondence between an inner psychic state, psychological state, and some external event. The correspondence having a high degree of improbability, so that it appears random or accidental or merely coincidental or merely chance. Jung and Pauli combined their brilliance and intuition and arrived at a theory of the universe. If matter behaves according to observation, then have human beings made their own reality? Have people's collective thoughts and dreams created our world? It's a notion that many scientists reject, but it echoes the occult. The uh, ancient occultist's idea of a, a latent consciousness that's uh, pervading the whole world would make some of the interpretations of quantum mechanics a great deal simpler, because if consciousness is essential to uh, the, the act of observation, to bringing a definite reality out of these quantum clouds of probability, uh, life 
in, in some ways get simpler if, if there are other sources of consciousness out there besides just us. The latest attempts to produce Einstein's unified field theory is string theory, which marries Newton's physics to quantum physics in a new theory of gravity. String theorists believe that at the smallest level imaginable, all matter is made up of vibrating strings. Those differences in observations in quantum physics are not due to the unconscious creating the universe, rather due to tiny variations in vibrations. String theory unifies the small and the large. We have Einstein's theory of general relativity, which is a theory of the gravitational force, and it works very well at explaining the large scale of the universe. We have quantum mechanics, which is the theory of the very small, and it also works extremely well. Uh, the trouble is these theories are not compatible. Um, you cannot construct a theory of quantum gravity by any of the conventional approaches. String theory looks extremely promising in that regard because it is innately a quantum theory. If true, it implies a fascinating realm of parallel universes and multiple dimensions. The way string theory does an elegant thing is that it says, okay, uh, there are these l tiny little things called strings and they make up all other particles that there are in the whole universe. And these strings are really just energy. And therefore, we've now gotten down to the very, very tiniest particle or element of what there is. And then since they're all just energy, the, we, we can think of ourselves as merely energy, which would be very satisfying for, for many people. There is a, a religious way to see that, and there's a you know, chemical way and a physical way to see that. But these theories may never be proven. Scientists have affected our world with work that has at first appeared magical. In 1895, Conrad Rentgen was experimenting with cathode rays when he noticed a green glow on a painted screen on his workbench. But the cathode ray tube was covered with black paper, which meant that these invisible rays passed through a solid. Experimenting further, he discovered that the rays could pass through skin, revealing the bones of his wife's hand. Imagine people's reaction to that. He was, here was a, imagine somebody told you, here's a table and there's a, there's a drawer, and then inside it, uh, there's some film, and I'm gonna pass these mysterious rays through your hand, and you see your bones. Now, people would say that's supernatural, that's occult. In fact, nobody believed him. And he said, I'm not gonna publish this in a scientific journal because it sounds almost occult. So in fact, I'm gonna publish it in a newspaper. So he published it in his wife's hand in a newspaper, and you could see the bones of a hand and it made history overnight. Rinken's work could have easily been dismissed. Put yourself back at that time. Here are people talking about physics and balls moving, light and this and that, and somebody publishes a paper saying there are these rays that go through your hand, which is opaque, and show the skeleton, the bones of your hand. You'd have said, this is garbage. You know, I mean, this is occult, okay? But it turned out it's not occult, it's a real phenomenon. But the difference is it was immediately repeated by a thousand laboratories all over the world. Will other occult beliefs become proven science? Originally from England, Margaret Barrett had little knowledge of the Civil War, but felt drawn to study it. One day, she happened upon a picture of John Pelham and noticed a striking resemblance. The gallant Pelham, as he was known, was killed by a Union shell at the age of 24. Does he live on in Margaret? Margaret suffers from chronic migraines She's had brain surgery for what I believe is the same injury that John Pelham died from. John Pelham died when a, when a shell exploded in the back of his head and pressed in his skull. And Margaret has had the same problem through which she's had brain surgery. So what is to be made of Margaret's belief in the apparent connection between Pelham's death and her condition? When I do a past life regression, the first thing I do is try and create a bridge. The bridge uh, is uh, some connection from the current life to a past life. It could be a fear, a phobia, um, it could be a job, a relationship. Uh, it really doesn't matter. Sometimes even he had dreams turn into be uh, bridges into the past life. So once I uh, do a thorough history, then I start to hypnotize a person. So what we try and do with a past life regression 
is help people learn from their previous lives so they don't make the same mistakes in their current life. Are we left with imprints of those who lived before us? We have this action and intelligence at a distance. The thing is, we have to connect to it. We have to be conscious of this possibility. Will discovering past lives someday be as commonplace as x-rays? Most scientists reject the idea. In the case of Röntgen, you did the experiment, people could all, everybody could repeat it, we accept it. In the case of Galileo's small stone and big stone, any child can go and repeat it. But that's not always true. Let's take velocity of light, and Einstein said it's finite. It took very, very detailed quantitative experiments to prove that was correct. You can't just do it quickly. Maybe some of these phenomena are so elusive and so tiny that it's gonna take ages to disprove. But this sounds like a cop-out to me. It just doesn't have a ring of truth. If you can't test a proposition, there's no way of testing it. It's not even part of our knowledge. It's as good as gibberish. Some explain past lives as simple associations. You say, well, I have seen this before, and yet I couldn't have. How is that possible? Well, maybe it was my previous birth. That's the only way this could have happened, because there's no way I could have met you, for example, prior to this evening, but I have this distinct feeling of having met you. How is that possible? Oh, maybe it was my previous birth. It's not your previous birth, it's your memory playing tricks on you. Progress has long been achieved by innovators who were willing to go far beyond accepted reality. In an interesting way, it almost seems that the evolution is really a kind of revolution, if you will. You sort of revolve through the same set of ideas, express them in different ways, find new tools for uh, deeply, for probing more deeply into the uh, core understanding, but ultimately we're still, we're looking at the same picture, the same universe, hopefully refining the understanding a bit, but we're working hand in hand with the ancient magicians. Today, the mind is as mysterious as the universe once was. Will scientists one day discover that human beings create their own reality? We're going to get some very big breakthroughs through science but it's going to come by science looking at what some might call the occult. There are certain things that I find very interesting in New Age beliefs uh, because I think they make explicit things that science just hasn't gotten to yet. I think everything that we don't have a scientific explanation for today, we will eventually have a scientific explanation for. Only time will tell what breakthroughs are in store at the crossroads of science and the occult.